Welcome to the Real Estate Investing Academy, your number one source for all things real estate investing and personal finance. With your host, Tom Stop. All right, everyone, we have a special guest today, um, somewhat famous, Michael Zuber, uh, <laughs> otherwise known as Zuber. Um, and I've, we've, uh, we've done a few of these uh, podcasts in the last few years, about once every six months. And so this has been the, the first one in a while. And um, obviously during this crazy time of COVID and a lot of movement in real estate, I definitely wanted to get him on and pick his brain on, on his journey and what he's doing and uh, why he did it in the first place. So we're going to open up here with a hard hitting interview on Zuber and kind of his, his thoughts on the, uh, the, the journey of passive income. So with that said, Zuber, uh, if you could give us a, you know, a minute or two high level, what you've been up to, um, where people can find you and, kind of just why you've been doing all this. Yeah. So uh, probably the easiest way to find me is on my YouTube channel called One Rental at a Time. Uh, I've gotten into the discipline the last year or year and a half of doing daily content. So I put out daily original content seven days a week, 365 days a year. Uh, so that's where to go. Um, if you want to know about our story in detail, I did write a book by the same title, One Rental at a Time sold thousands of copies on Amazon and is a whisper shy of a thousand on audible, uh, nice. which has only been on audible for like three months now. So nice. far exceeded my self published, um, you know, expectations, right? Just never know where this goes, but really when's a point. The, uh, when's the next book? <laughs> I, uh, I need to, I need to motivate myself because I am not uh, a great writer. Writing is hard for me. It's so a grind, it's, isn't it? It's, it's tough. Uh, but that's my story in the book. Um, yeah. So I don't know where you want to go, but basically full-time employee to financially free at 45. So, yeah. And what, I mean, so I think the, you know, kind of the conversation of this podcast and we'll see where it goes. Right. But uh -huh. I think a lot of people are debating these days, like, man, I grind every day from eight to six, whatever. And how do I get out of this? You know, I, I got all these bills. I know there's a journey of passive income, but it seems like it's five to 10 years out. What do I do? So like, what, what ultimately yeah. made you do that? Like jump the ship and say, you know what? Enough. I'm gonna get out of the rat race. Passive income is a way to, to go. Yeah. So I, I guess, you know, you ask a question, I give you my answer. And when I started the journey on my 30th birthday, which was almost two decades ago now, um, it wasn't about financial freedom. It was, frankly, I want to have a better retirement, right? That's where my vision started. And now that may have been small, that might have been short-sighted, but I didn't grow up with any money, right? Nobody in my family had any kind of wealth, any kind of wealth. And all of them worked until they were dead, literally, right? My, my grandfather, right? I remember, I think he passed away at like 68 or 69 and he worked that day, right? So that, that's where I come from. So for me, it wasn't about financial freedom. It was, you know what? I'm not a big believer in the stock market. I was personally burned by two thieves, Enron and WorldCom, uh, back in the early 2000s, mm -hmm. uh, and have it been back. You know, um, th that you know, once you lose six figures in, in a couple of stocks back to back, like within 60 days, it's hard to go back. So I'm, I, I knew there had to be a better way, and for me, it was real estate. Right? I read Rich Dad Poor Dad. I didn't get much out of it other than oh. Being a landlord's good, right? Because all he does is talk about two condos, his in Honolulu and hers in Portland or somewhere. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, I can get one. And then I got one and then I got two. Uh, and then where it really changed for us is about five or six years into our journey where we had only eight houses. The market got nuts, which we could be on the cusp of getting nuts again. But it got so nuts. Uh, a house that we bought for 107 went to 264 in three and a half years. Mm -hmm. um, and we felt stuck because we needed a ninth house, right? Eight houses was interesting. It certainly would have made a better financial future, but we had enough capital by the ninth. And we, we just couldn't do it. The numbers were wrong, right? It was an alligator. So we did a bunch of 1031 exchanges and we went from houses to apartments and that uh, really set us on our path. Yep. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Bless you. Um, yeah. So it's, I, you know, I talk to clients every day, right. And I think a lot of them do want to get started and they're right on the precipice of doing it. Yeah. But, you know, it's almost as if they don't know what they don't know, yeah. you know, and, which is why we're, we have this Academy and why we teach them on our, our programs here, but there's still that fear of the unknown, you know, it's a different asset class. And while it is somewhat easy to understand, there's still that, that, that fear. And I guess what I would ask of you, what is, what is some advice you would yeah. give those that are almost ready, but not yeah. quite there. 
You know what I would tell most folks is most, because again, we, I've been invited to speak in, in front of thousands of people now telling our story of one house to financial freedom. And what I quickly realized after doing that for six or nine months is, you know, when you tell our story, I, we get what I call fake fans. You know, people wanted, they clap for you because they're legitimately happy for mm -hmm. you. Um, but it doesn't create action. I can see them going to their cars afterwards, talking to their significant other going, well, good for them, but we can't do that. Right. It's like mm -hmm. a bridge too far. So for the last year or so, I've been talking about four, right? Let's set a goal of getting everybody to four rental properties because four rental properties will change your financial future. It yep. probably won't retire you. You probably won't be financially free, but if you buy four conservatively financed properties, that cash flow um, in, in 20 to 30 years, you, you have options, right? You can sell one, pay off three. You can refi, you can gift them to your kids. So what I've spent a lot of time and I would recommend anybody who's right on the cusp is stop the social media goals of being financially free and hundreds or thousands of units. It's okay to get four. Yep. And when we get to four, then you can come back to, to Tom and I and say, okay, do we want to go to 10? Yep. But let's stop talking about the Uber financial freedom and let's get everybody to get to four. If we can help a thousand people just get to four, man. Oh, it's huge. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the thing, right? Like you look at, and you know, Grant Cardone, great for him. You know, he's had mm -hmm. an interesting journey. Um, you know, you look at the Kia Hockeys, you look at, you know, the, the Gary V's of the world, all these big, big people. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and they're pushing the idea of owning 500 units. It's like, well, yeah, but you, you don't own one yet. Right. Yeah, and exactly. It's even, you know, I look back when I started, it's like, I, I knew nothing getting started. I mean, I knew very little. I, I, I knew that the idea of, you know, paying down the equity and get, mm -hmm. getting the cash flow and the tax benefits, awesome, right? But I didn't know about all the little things that you have to watch out for. And every property and every month that you own one, you learn a little bit more and more. Yeah. And so to, you know, Grant Cardone's book, actually, it, it, you know, it's a pretty good book if you're interested in multifamily. But he, he says, you know, if he's going to, if he had to redo it, he would just go out and buy a 30 unit building from day one. And it's like, from my experience, if you were to do that, you would overlook so many variables and get your, and maybe you're lucky. Maybe you find a gem and it just works out for you. Yeah. But I, 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 I think that is very harmful advice, frankly. Yeah. Uh, first and foremost, most people don't have the income power to save enough to buy a 30 unit building as the, it'd take them 40 years. Yeah. Or is that real? When it happens. Yeah. Is, is that really what you want for people? What yeah. he wants for people is he wants, I, I don't know if I could say this. I, I guess he wants to help people, but he wants to help himself and his family first. Right. Oh, yeah. There's, 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 there's a priority problem yep. where, where I sit. I want to help people first. Um, I'm already done. Right. I'm sitting on the ledge of financial freedom. I have no interest in getting a private jet or a Bentley or a $30,000 freaking watch that he likes to flex. Yeah. Um, I'm going to sit on my little ledge and be comfortable for the rest of my life. And I'm okay with that. So I'm going to keep reaching down and helping people and getting four single family rentals is the right answer. Frankly, in the environment we're in today, bigger is not better. Not better. Not even close. No, yeah. the numbers don't support that. So, um, yeah, yeah. well, you know, it, it's interesting too, because I think, you know, again, I just talked to a guy yesterday who wants to buy, um, he's like, you know, should I buy a single family? Should I buy, you know, like an eight unit building? And it's like, well, you know, okay, you don't have anything right now. How much do you know? Do you have you ever picked up a hammer? Yeah. Um, so I think if you do pick, you know, buy a single family home, it affords you the ability to make some mistakes. Well, yeah, right? absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You have you not only it, it, it they're cheaper mistakes, right? Um, you also have better recovery if you did make a mistake, right? Yeah. When you, when you have a single family home, you have potentially multiple buyers. When you have an eight unit building, your only mm -hmm. answer is investors. Right. Right. And oh, by the way, you and I have seen the lending landscape change. What happens if banks like today just go, nope, we're not lending anymore. Like Wells no, Fargo, no. nope, not lending here. Right? Go somewhere else. It happens. I've seen it twice now, once back in 2010 and once in, now in 2020. Um, no, single family homes, owner occupants, FHA will always be sent, right? Of adults have their home. Uh, buy a, most people it's hard for me to say all oh, that's too declarative, but most people should start with a single family home. Yeah. Agreed. And I, again, you know, I tell everyone too, real estate is a journey, right? And I think we, you're right. The social media obsession of 
passive, you know, doing yeah. nothing. It's like, I, I know of a few of those investments, mostly like dividend reinvestment programs or like yeah. passive money lending. Like there are some generally passive investments, but they only have so many benefits. I mean, real estate has a variety of benefits and, you know, it shouldn't be your only investment, but it's, it's a good one. And it's not mm -hmm. entirely passive by any means. There's some work involved, but the journey is rewarding. I mean, in a number of ways, right? The learning experience, the fact that you're growing your asset worth, someone's and just essentially investing in your asset worth for you. Mm -hmm. um, it's relatively safe if you just do your research up front and don't make a dumb move like buying in a non cash flowing property, as you always mention, or yeah. you know, buying in a peak, which is pretty obvious if you just follow some ver certain variables. Yeah. You know, um, but yeah, so, well, okay, so that's, that's on the real estate front. I guess I want to go back to more of the, the, this, just the philosophy mm -hmm. of passive income. I mean, when you were going about it, was it more, hey, I just need to grow my top line, you know, get my cash flow going, or is it more a combination of reducing your expenses and also, you know, investing in a top line? Well, for me, uh, priority number one was reducing our family expenses, right? Um, I guess I was a typical American at the time where I spend 100% of take home pay uh, without ever thinking about it. I mean, it, it's embarrassing to look back on the stupid things we purchased or I purchased, I should say, I purchased, um, you know, just silly things. And for us, it all started with cutting expenses. I call it needs and wants. If you're going to go on this journey to financial freedom, you've got to be comfortable for a certain set of time not doing your wants, right? Do your needs, right? Take care of your family. We raised a daughter in that environment. She had everything she needed and some of her wants. But Olivia and I sacrificed like nothing other. Some of the most emotional days I had uh, were after leaving, um, you know, parties for our friends who had a, got a new home, right? They moved mm -hmm. into a new home in Mountain View or Los Altos or whatever. And they had a big backyard or a pool or, you know, some nonsense like that. And here we are sitting in a condo that we bought in 99 mm -hmm. and had none of those things, right? And I remember pulling over after like eight or nine years and just losing it. Uh, yeah. on the way home from another party. Uh, but, you know, fast forward a decade, you know, we haven't worked in years and, and, you know, that individual is still paying a pretty hefty mortgage payment. So, you know, that's, you know, and I, I have the same feeling because it's, it's interesting. Those that are taking the passive income path and it's becoming more of a trend. Absolutely. But it's still not very common, right? Yeah. People still don't know the, uh, the idea of, you know, investing in income producing assets. And so you're, you're that, you're that salmon, swimming against the others. And it's, unless you're able to remain, you know, true to that philosophy, you're going to be challenged by constant beacons like that. Like, Oh, they, they you know, Sally got a new home or, you mm -hmm. know, and got a new BMW. And it's like, I want that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is those sacrifices for a few years that will put you in a better spot in 10. Yeah. I mean, what I'll leave you with again, we wrote that book one rental at a time is evidence that it works. And, and, what I tell people these days is we invested 15 years to get 25 years of freedom. That's right. Um, you know, it's not a bad return. And, and mm -hmm. it's, not like, it's not like our life was terrible for those 15 years. It's just that we didn't do anything fun. We didn't do any crazy vacations. We didn't buy new cars. We didn't upgrade our house. Um, you know, uh, and we didn't keep up with the Joneses, right? We had nothing to flex on uh, for 15 years. And uh, now if we wanted to, we could, but, but we choose not to. So yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, so on that point, it's interesting, right? Because I think, um, yeah, that, that sacrifice was, was temporary. What is your, if you don't mind sharing, what is your mm -hmm. Monday through Friday daily routine? Uh, yeah, I'm a routine driven person. So I'm up at 6 a.m. I've been that way since I was a teenager. No alarm clock. My eyes just open. Some, sometime between 5.57 and 6.08, six days a week. It's, it's an amazing awesome. thing. It's, it's like, it doesn't matter what time I go to bed either. It's crazy. Uh, so I'm up. Uh, I spend about an hour to 90 minutes just reading the financial news. Um, I read everything I can. Uh, I believe one of the things that has made me successful is trying to figure out where the consumer is going in cost of capital. Mm -hmm. uh, then I spend about 60 minutes producing content for uh, my YouTube channel uh, every day. Uh, then, then I'll have breakfast, play with the dog, uh, I'll work out. Uh, and then after one o'clock, it's um, just Olivia and I. So I have, a, I have a pretty good life and it's that way seven days a week, um, you know, every day is Saturday for us. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the routine now. Yeah. And, and, you know, I'm going to dig a little deeper if you don't mind. So sure. 
I mean, again, I think that's kind of the life people want. I, I for sure want to be able to do something like that and um, but do it also in different parts of the United States, right? So it's a sure. interesting balance, right? Um, so, you know, and I'm just for you all out there, I'm, I'm on that precipice, but I, I also, so my philosophy is not only will I have enough coming in to pay the bills, but mm-hmm. have an additional 25 to 30%. So I can continue to invest and save and everything else because sure. I'm, I'm like, like you, Zuber, I was um, raised in a very humble family, mm-hmm. I was single mom, two kids, she had three jobs and I just got frightened with yeah. not having money. And it just, oh yeah, it scared, it has scared the bejesus out of me so much that in my blood, I like, if my bank account begins to dwindle, I just, I freak out. Right. So yeah, I understand. Um, but so as you're living this essentially semi-retired life now, um, very early, are you seeing your income continue to increase or is it decreasing? I mean, what's happening on that side? Well, so sort of two answers there. It's not about the top. Once you retire and you're a real estate investor, it's not about the top line, right? When I lost my W2, which is way back in 2018 now, uh, my top line went down, right? But I don't spend top line. Neither do you. No. My bottom line increased, right? My what I was able to pay, pay bills and play with and buy more stuff grew because, you know, my bottom line was pretty well insulated given depreciation and all the other benefits of real estate investing. So um, yeah, my, my bottom line has grown. Uh, yeah. My top line's down, right? I don't have that six figure job, Sure, uh, sure. but that's okay. I don't, I don't spend top line. I spend bottom line. Yep. Cool. And you're, I mean, you're, but you're still doing activities in the market, right? You're, oh, you're yeah. Being active. Yeah. And so what are some of those activities that, that, are, that are keeping you busy three hours yeah. a day? Yeah. So I, uh, uh, we, so we retired simply as buy and hold investors, but once you retire and you're relatively young at 45 and you're scaled in your market, you need to find something to do. So we started flipping properties and I started flipping properties in a unique and special way. Lots of people flip in Fresno, which is my market, but they flip to owner occupants. They're flipping to three and a half percent down FHA buyers and all of that stuff. I don't want to play there. Uh, so what I've done is I'm, I'm flipping the landlords. I go buy the most disgusting slumlord properties. I spend 40 to 80 grand fixing them up. I stick a tenant in at market rent and then I sell the landlords. And we've done 51 of those in the last, what is it now? Two and a half years. Nice. And um, that's a lot of fun. Um, you know, that's something we picked up. Uh, we, you know, it produces a, a nice addition in income. Uh, but again, for me, it's about filling my cup. I'm helping lots of new people start. We've had lots of repeat buyers. Uh, but when you could take an asset, you can improve it. You can sell it. Somebody can go get a three and a half or 3.7% loan on it. It just blows my mind. A first time investor. Um, yeah, that's fun. And we've added probably 20 units to our portfolio. Nice. Uh, and we've sold, we sold an apartment building uh, because I think multifamily is overpriced. So we have some cash for when the market turns. So there's lots of things we've been doing. We, we're cert- Real estate investors, once you get good at it, it doesn't have an age limit, right? You could do no. it for the rest of your life. No. No. Uh, so we're, we're, I don't know. I think our most transactions was 2010. All of those were purchases, but last year and the year before we're pretty close buys and sells. Yeah. You know, and that's, it's, it's, it's such a good spot to be in too, that you, you don't have to rush to make a decision no. because you're already there. It's like every, every choice I'm going to make is going to follow general guidelines that I believe in is going to be the right deal. You, yeah. you can be patient, right? Yeah. Um, and that's, again, that's the beauty when you're not trying to race to get to that income. Once you already <laughs> have it, it's like, you know, time's on your side, right? Yeah. If, there, if there's a deal that's a question mark today, that's an automatic no, where maybe yeah. 10 years ago it would have been, I would have, I would have beat up my Excel spreadsheet to make it a yes. Today it's like, meh, meh, let, yep. let it go. Awesome. Awesome, man. So let's, let's spend another, uh, let me, last five minutes. I just want to get your take um, on a few things. Cause I, I have a take too. And I, it's a, it's, it's a weird, it's a strange time, right? I think we can all agree to that. Um, hmm. But I, I've been thinking about it a lot more the last month or two. And obviously like you, I read the journal and a bunch of other you know, articles, the mm-hmm. economists. And I, I look at earnings reports and all that stuff. And um, I, I think back in like 2014, I first heard of the idea that there's essentially Two, two economies, right? And that yep. came from a Tiffany's report on their earnings saying that the high-end consumer is doing really well, mm-hmm. low-end consumer is doing pretty terrible. Okay. That was, that was six years ago. Fast forward <laughs> to the day, and I think what my take is, and there's essentially two economies, 
Yep. Right. There's, and I'll put it in terms of neighborhood classes. There's the C and D class, uh, which is people working in the service industry, entertainment industry, you know, the, the, the lower paying industries, unfortunately, which are essential workers in my, in my opinion as well. And then you have the other class, the tech workers, the people who have cushy jobs that are pretty stable. And I think what I'm seeing is the economies on the C and D class are really taking a tank and it's going to be extremely hard for them here in, in, in the next. In fact, the unemployment checks run out this, this week. Um, you know, there's a, apparently more stimulus in the pipeline, but it, it's not looking good. And so I'm seeing in the real estate market, uh, some things too. I, I have a, a friend who manages a big fund, uh, more conservative fund, and they're ponying up to expect foreclosures to happen in two categories. The first one is in that CD class neighborhood, you know, people who really are around Vegas and Florida, service oriented jobs, lower end homes, but they're also expecting in these high end markets like San Francisco, the mom and pop investors that bought the alligators, the ones that didn't cash flow, or if they did very little. And now with the new rent laws that essentially don't require people to pay rent, hmm. uh, they're expecting to see those mom and pop investors go belly up here in the fall. Everything in between, they, they see stability. So I'd be curious to get your thoughts on, you mm -hmm. know, next six months from now, where do you see things? Um, so first and foremost, everybody wants to call, right? Are we in an L, a U, a V, all of that? Um, I'm pretty confident we are in a K-shaped recovery. Everybody went down together. Uh, but what's going to happen in this is we are going to have some winners and some losers, hence the K. So I agree with you. Um, I think we're going to have some winners and losers, and it's probably going to be more skewed than we've ever seen. Uh, meaning there'll be less winners, and, but they'll win big and there'll be more losers. And unfortunately they will lose big. Um, I see a lot of pain, but you did add one wrinkle there. Uh, I don't see a lot of that pain happening this year. I mm. believe a lot of this, and it's only because it's an election year, only reason. Uh, what we're about to see come out of the federal government, even though they hate each other, is a stimulus package that gets us through the election, mm -hmm. in my opinion. And we have all these forbearance and all these other things that even if you started this, I've been through a, a short sale foreclosure market. It again will be January, February. Um, so my personal belief is there will be tremendous pain and opportunity. I believe you've called the right areas. It's just the time frame I disagree with. I believe that's all starting Q1 of next year. Mm -hmm. um, that's my suspicion. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, it's again, this is we're putting a picture nationally. I think obviously it's market to market. You know, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm, I'm in Austin, Texas, and there is no sign of slowdown here because everyone's moving here, so it's a different beast. Um, and it's probably the same for like Charlotte and Nashville, people, where people are moving. It's probably going to be okay. Well, here, let's play with that because I'm on that topic. I'm looking at that sure. a lot. So there are basically any city that's vertical loses. New York, San Francisco. Because what you are seeing is space is good. Everybody remembers the last crisis. And in this crisis, space is good. I want a backyard for my kids' swing set. I want an extra room for my uh, Zoom conference calls. Um, you know, I, I don't want to have an elevator because I'm scared to be in an elevator, right? Every vertical city is in trouble. Second, every state that has high state income tax is in trouble. Yeah. Because you know what? My employer, especially the high paying jobs, they're saying I can live anywhere. So let me go over a state or two, save the 13.3% in state income. Let me, oh, by the way, I'm not going to be a renter. I could be a renter in San Francisco and a buyer in Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. That is a fundamentally family-oriented change. So that migration is real. It's happening faster and in greater quantities than I could have ever managed right now. Yep. Uh, and I think that goes on for years. Um, so you double whammy that? Man, San Francisco and New York are blank. <laughs> Oof, I mean, wow, they're... I mean, our oh. governor is screwed. Audio says blank. I'll put the word in the video. <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying it, but boy, freaking Newsom and yeah, New York and oh, San, California are toast. It's, toast. Um, yeah, it's yeah, and you know, it, not to make it political, but it, yeah, it's definitely been um, it's hard to comprehend. You know, the level of damage 
that is going to come here into San Francisco and the Bay Area, and New York too. I mean, you're, you're already seeing people move out to Connecticut and New you know, Jersey, Maine, Vermont, yeah. you know, the places that are nice, you know? Yeah. Um, and I mean, I, I read a report that California is going to lose 30,000 of their 70,000 restaurants. Easy. Right? And I, I just, I just uh, look at an article and I, I like good food. I think we all do, most people. I, I read an article uh, currently of the, some, some of the restaurants that are closed in San Francisco permanently. And these are like staple restaurants that are just, mm-hmm. I, I mean, make up the culture of that city gone. And it's, you know, yeah. it's just mind blowing. It's like, how do you recover from that? It, they can't. So it's going to be a decade of recovery. It's going to have to, it, it's, this is going to be New York. I don't know what it was, the 80s, where it went down, it got, got uber terrible and it kind of revitalized. San Francisco, New York, and you go through that again. Because again, San Francisco, again, I'm not being political. I'm not saying parties, but this is what they're doing. They're seeing these huge budget shortfalls and they're already saying, let's go tax the rich. Let's tax yeah. them more. You're making a mistake. Those are the people with financial options. Yeah. They go three hours east, they're in Nevada. Yeah. You know, They'll get on their jets to come out here for work. Yeah. There will be more and more rich people who just say enough. Plus, why do you want to walk around San Francisco and deal with all the homeless and the stuff yeah, on the well, streets and all, all of that? Too. It's, it's crazy. It's closed, right? So you are paying yeah. $3,500 for a one bedroom, but you're not getting the access, access to the restaurants, cafes. And it's like, you're, uh, you know, and, and I'll tell you, I see if my friends are like, I'm out. I'm, I'm done. And, um, and they go renter to owner. That's in a, that's a powerful financial decision, right? This is a real estate yeah. podcast. Yeah. Just think. I could dump 300 to 3,500 bucks in a one bedroom in San Francisco tower, or I could pay 3,700 for a 4,000 square foot house. Yeah, in I, that's about, that's, that, that's about where I'm at. I, you know, 3,200 square foot home, three story, uh, yeah. modern build. I have a patio on, on my roof. I got, I'm overlooking. Oh, by the yeah. way, I'm not paying income tax. I'm like, yeah. Done. <laughs> it's like, well, and my schools are great. So Done. it's, uh, yeah, it's, um, no, California's in trouble change because people are moving here. So, you know, supply and demand, but Oh darn, you bought ahead of the curve. So you're going to get yeah, some appreciation. Yeah, it's just, geez, it's, um, it's terrible. It's, it's, it's wild times. And I think uh, it goes, goes back to the initial point. Like if you're buying in the right markets, you're buying the right product um, and hopefully at generally the right time, you'll probably be okay. Right. Yeah. I think the single family home will be the next, again, in most areas, right. Remove, remove from this statement, the 10 markets that are vertical. Right. Most of the U.S. will see the single family home as the best asset for the next decade. That's right. And I just did a podcast recently um, because of the supply and demand, right? I, it, there's 2.5 million units right now short of what is needed. And the builders are producing about 1.2 million. And they yep. need to just be about producing about 1.7. And, I just and they're a- doing it in wrong areas. If you look at the map yeah. today, a lot of the existing production are in bad markets. Because two years ago when they did the plan, that's what they yep. wanted to build. So yep. when you look at the mismatch of supply and demand, it's even worse. Yeah. And I just saw a report that they're, I mean, I guess I would too, maybe developers are pulling back on their production by, by about 30%. So now you have a 1.2 million, you know, plan going down to about 900,000 units. Yep. So that's going to add to the supply and demand. It's, so again, I think you're right. If you pick the right markets in buying single family, it's, it's, I don't know how it doesn't appreciate in most markets. So you know. It's, it's going to be good. I mean, I would tell your listeners to go back and look at 04, 05, 06. Um, those were three years in a row that at least in California, they were double digit increases. Yep. And that can happen. The supply yep. demand picture is the wackiest I have seen in 20 years. I've been doing this for 20 years. And this is, this is a dangerous time. Mm-hmm. Supply is usually here. And I've been in, we've been in lots of sell side um, markets. This is, if it's usually like this, buyer, sellers, Sellers are down here because the supply is gone and buyers have actually gone up because of this yep. health crisis. It is wacky. Crazy. Wacky today. Yep. Well, you know, that's good stuff, man. I'm, you know, it's always good to hear that we're usually on the same page. We need to get someone in here that, you know, that, you know, has the opposite views and thinks San Francisco is bullish or New York's bullish. Oh gosh. I would love to hear that argument. <laughs> <laughs> It awesome. will eventually be great, but not right yeah, now. Actually, yeah, it all comes in waves and goes, right? So um, awesome stuff. So let's, uh, once again, let's hear where people can find you one more time. Yeah, if you uh, want to see some daily original content, go to my YouTube channel. It is called the One Rental at a Time. It's just youtube.com slash one rental at a time. Awesome.
awesome. And I'll, uh, everyone, I'll, I'll put the links in the video for you as well as the um, on our podcast page. Too. Okay. Thanks, I don't want to die today. Hey.